Welcome to another edition of the Southeastern 14 Southeastern Conference Basketball Roster Preview Edition for the 2021-22 season. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Blake Lovell joins us. Blake, today we will talk about the Auburn Tigers, one of many teams with interesting off-seasons, but I think Auburn's was about as interesting as anyone's. Well, they brought in several new guys, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how they fit into the mix. Of course, some of those guys we're familiar with, uh, Katie Johnson from Georgia and, of course, Walker Kessler of North Carolina, and um, they brought in some other guys I think that are going to have a chance to contribute too, but I really think it's what they brought back that was probably the most important uh, to get, you know, Alan Flanagan back and, you know, someone like that who, as we talked about last year, I mean, he wound up being one of the best players in the league. I mean, you could have, you know, put him in the top 10 in the league, and I don't think a lot of people may have been surprised by that, um, but I think you just watch him play, and, and he's he's that good uh, whenever he's, you know, at his best, and of course, he had to take on a bigger load at times last season because of Sharif Cooper and all that being in and out. But I think really for, for Auburn, it's going to be about, you know, I mean, not getting someone back like JT Thor, which would have been a big part of their, their front court, but still like they've got, they've got depth. Um, you know, they bring in Jabari Smith, just a, a very, very talented freshman um, who will instantly probably be one of the best in the league. They, they've got a lot to work with, and I think that's every time you talk about a, a really good Bruce Pearl team, he's usually got good depth, and he's got some guys that can, can fill it up, and uh, I think they've, they've got the combination of both of those this season. Well, you started where I would have started with this team. Alan Flanagan is probably the, the key piece in my mind, at least among the returnees. There are three guys that played a lot who were back. Well, really four if you include Dylan Cardwell, although he was more of a role player. But Flanagan, Jalen Williams, Devin Cambridge all played a lot a year ago. They were all back. Of course, they lost Cooper. They lost Thor. Uh, they lost Justin Powell to Tennessee. They lost Jamal Johnson. But still, it's a decent returning core. And with Flanagan, we talked before the podcast, some of these numbers with some of these players – like, I did not realize Jalen Williams scored as much as he did. I'd forgotten he was as much a part of a, their offense as he was at times. But sometimes with teams, numbers are a little bit deceiving. Uh, but I think with Flanagan, when I watched him play a year ago, you need that transcend transcendent player who can take over a game the way Cooper did. I thought Flanagan could be that guy at times and show that ability at the end of the season. And to me, that's why I think he's so important. It's not just the numbers he put on paper. It was the whole thing of, can he be the guy when he needs to be the guy? And we did see him do that at times. Yeah. And I mean, he led them in pretty much every statistical category, seemingly the top ones. Um, and like you said, I, I think just the Really see the way he evolved. I mean, his offense. I mean, think about it. This is a guy who the year before, I mean, he had one double-digit scoring game, I think, the year before. And now he comes out last season, and you just look at all the points he put up. Now, yes, yeah, some of that was out of necessity because they didn't have Sharif Cooper at times. But I think eventually, you know, now he's at a point where it's that's not just because Sharif Cooper wasn't there. Like, he's just, I think, developed himself into that type of player where um, he's going to, you know, he's going to have a chance to have 15-plus point-type games every single night, and, and that'll make him, again, one of the best players in the league. But he'll be the one that, that carries this team. There's no doubt about it, just based on sort of that experience from last season. And like I said, it's not just scoring, but he led them in so many different categories. Now, I know at times, you know, we had a lot of turnovers, but again, we have to remember that this was a team, um, you know, again, in some situations playing without the guy they expected to really do 95% of the uh, the ball handling and such and Sharif Cooper. So, I think that is something that will, will work itself out. I, I'm not necessarily overly concerned with that because he did have to be someone that just had, I mean, such a high usage rate because he, that's, they really had it. I mean, they, they needed that. Um, it was, you know, not certainly the season they wanted uh, based on the outcome, but I think, yeah, he, he's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And now I think with some of the complimentary pieces he has around him that they brought in, um, I think it'll, it'll make things a little bit easier because I don't know that they had, they didn't necessarily have that depth last year, I think, uh, that they probably wanted uh, overall. And, you know, again, it was it was a unique season for them. Not having a chance to play, you know, in the tournament, all this other stuff. Like, it was, it was going to be one of those weird seasons, I think, for Auburn. Uh, but now, I think now that they do have more depth and they do have someone like that who's a, you know, first-team all-SEC type guy, and they've probably got multiple of those guys, 
um, yeah, I think they'll they'll be fine. Well, here's the question I have: When we look up at seasons in, will Flanagan have been their best player? Will it be somebody like Jabari Smith, who is a top ten recruit, McDonald's All American, a six ten big, kind of skinny? but just a kid who is a, a superstar, potentially. Walker Kessler, a kid who was a McDonald's All-American who transferred in from North Carolina. Interesting play. I got to see him play in a high school. I mean, I don't know how you classify Kessler. Maybe we can circle back to him in a minute, but certainly in terms of just height, two tremendous bigs that could have played anywhere in the country that Auburn landed. Yeah, and I mean, this is, you know, this is something where I think – we know we know how Bruce Pearl wants to play. He wants guys that can shoot, and he wants guys that can step out and make shots, no matter if you're five foot ten or six foot ten. And I think that's what he's got, you know, with both of those guys in particular, and Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler. I mean, these are two guys who can step out and shoot, uh, but they can also, you know, be able to to score in the paint and, and do things like that. So I think that gives them really a lot of versatility. And really, I mean, if you think about it, you could argue this is kind of the most versatile, perhaps front court big man type group that Bruce Pearl's had there in a while if I'm trying to think back maybe ever like in terms of uh, and, and that's not taking a knock on guys like Anthony McLemore Austin Wiley or anyone's like you know guys like that but I think you just talk about the overall versatility like you feel like those two guys in particular Kessler and Smith um, they they can step out and, and make shots at any time on the perimeter but they're also you know big enough and I think like you said may, maybe strength is something where once you get into the college off-season type program and the strength training and all that that comes along with it, these guys are going to naturally get stronger. Um, but I really feel like that you know these these are guys they can use in a lot of different ways. So um, it's going to be interesting because we've always kind of thought about the guard group with Auburn being really the the biggest strength when you think about it year in and year out. Uh, but I think this season, you know, you look at guys like this and you're thinking, boy, if they if they can meet those expectations, uh, again, two guys who our five-star type guys, you know, coming out of high school and, and kind of what knowing what the potential is with them. I mean, they've, they, they've got a lot of possibilities there. Uh, they're still going to have a really good backcourt. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But these guys are very intriguing, uh, I think, in the front court, And so it, it'll be interesting to see kind of how things uh, fit in there with them. No, you made a great point. When you think back over the history of Auburn basketball players and the great – players who've come through that program you're thinking point guards and wings I mean if you want to go post I, I guess their best guy technically is Charles Barkley but he's he's in his own category of players there's never been one like him before and it has not been since and probably never will be again but yeah that's a good point you don't think when you think of Auburn basketball and how it is won you don't start thinking about the fours and the fives but that might be where this, this team's foundation is yeah, and that's like I said, I mean, I, th that wasn't me trying to take anything away from, you know, because I, I think that certainly like Anthony McLemore, Austin Wiley, Horace Spencer, like guys like that have been pretty essential to the, that success they had for several years. I mean, really, you know, we're talking about teams that made it to the, to the Final Four and, and all of that. But I think still you, you thought about it, it's like, well, Jared Harper, Bryce Brown, like those – those are the guys you're thinking, okay, that's the driving force of these teams. You know, Chumo Kiki before he got hurt. Um, that was kind of what you feel like has, has been the driving force for Auburn under Bruce Pearl. It's just been the guard play. And like I said, I still think that's probably going to be the case again this season. Um, I think that's where everything will start just because of the, the approach they have and how they want to play. But I do think having, you know, again, two guys like that who are as, as big as they are, that can play in a lot of different areas in terms of, you know, you, you don't have to necessarily, you can't just guard him and say, all right, we guard this guy six feet in and okay, well, he, he's going to beat us there, but we're not worried about anything else. Well, no, these guys can step out and make shots. And that that's what we've seen. Any Bruce Pearl team, the most dangerous teams we've seen of his have been the ones where so many guys, maybe four or even five guys on the floor can all step out and make threes. And I think this is where this season you probably got that potential with a group like this, even if, you know, maybe it doesn't wind up being his best shooting group he's had there. But I think that just having big men that can do that in this day and age, as we know, is such a big thing. Um, and, and that's something where I think that, that they're really going to have an opportunity uh, to, to make up some ground probably and be able to, to be a little bit more efficient in that area. Because when you look at it, I mean, it's interesting to think, isn't it? Because Auburn 
over the past couple seasons, like they have not shot the ball well at all from outside. Like they have not been a good shooting team, uh, which again is sort of a, a different contrast than what you would think from those teams previously. That team that won 30 games, you know, got to the Final Four. Um, you know, that team shot what was it, 38 percent, I think, from three. And now you look at the past couple of seasons, they haven't shot any better than I think 32.5, 32.6%. So that is something where I know they want to be better there and they have to be better there, I think, to, to be able to, you know, have a chance to, to win an SEC title. But um, that's where I think having big guys like that and bringing them in and knowing they can shoot, uh, that just allows you to kind of, uh, you know, open things up a little bit more in that area. If I can take us on a quick sidebar with Auburn, I really regret and this is just the way it goes. If you're a talented big with a lot of upside, you're going to go in the NBA draft, which Thor did at 37th overall. But I really wanted to see what JT Thor could have been in another year of college because I just thought he was a fascinating player with the size and some things that he could do. Yeah. No, I mean, he's just – he's a beast. Like, you know, that's what we always laugh. Like, the – the Thor name was fitting, just in terms of uh, yes. what, what he could do. It's, the most appropriate name in recent SEC basketball history. Yeah, I, I mean, it's and, – and I don't know. Like, I I always thought it was kind of back and forth in terms of whether he would come back or whether he would stay. But, um, you know, I, I'm always of the opinion I'm never going to blame a, a blame a guy for if having the opportunity to potentially go in the first round. And, like, you know, if you're 37, it's like, well – Maybe you weren't going to go in the first round, but you you weren't that far off. And so, um, yeah, it would have been nice because, you know, that's where, look, if you put him on this team, um, it's, it's it's just it's something. Like you, you were talking about just an unbelievable uh, front court there and, and all the options they would have at that point. But, you know, too, this, this is still where, you know, I think, you know, you look at someone like Walker Kessler, right? Like you want to see – we know like the pedigree there. We know the potential, but – you want to you want to see that. Um, I think you want to see you know that expectation met, and I think you know it's the same with Jabari Smith. Even though he comes out, you know, as a as a top player, uh, I don't I don't have really many doubts that he's going to be in a spot to to you know make a big impact right away. But you never know sometimes, and um, I think though that, that they they pretty much have a good idea of what they're getting with these guys. And uh, like you said, it would have been nice to to have Thor back in that group, but uh, they've still got options to choose from here. Okay, let's talk about Walker Kessler because to me he's a huge wild card. I saw him play in high school, and I saw him in a game where he could have gone in the paint, dominated, and probably gotten, you know, forty and twenty-five, and maybe more. And he was content to sit out and, and hunt his shot behind the three-point line, which Carolina did not let him do much at all last year. I think he took what three three-pointers. So you talked about Bruce Pearl. And what he likes to do with bigs and spread the floor and let guys shoot from all over the place. That, to me, is going to be fascinating to see how it works out. And frankly, I just when I saw him, he wasn't there yet. And I guess Carolina made that same judgment. But I'm interested to see how this plays out in terms of style and usage. What are they going to let him do? Yeah, and that's the thing is I don't – I guess I don't know exactly what to expect from them this season from – stylistic standpoint because like we said they do have someone like Flanagan back they've got some guards they're bringing in you know that you know the expectation is Jabari Smith will be able to just play right away and, and play a lot of minutes so yeah it's it's a good question I think for for Kessler because you know the potential is there we, we know that we understand that this is someone who's coming out you know he's a top he's a top 25 kid coming out and you know there's not a whole lot you can't teach 7-1 we always say you can't teach that type of height and Again, you especially can't teach it when the guy who can step out and make shots. So I, I think that he will he will bring a lot to them, I think, on the offensive side of the floor. I think will be interesting to see kind of how he fits into their their system there because I, I feel like he's he's a really good fit from the standpoint of knowing this is a team that's going to get up and down the floor and, and, and make shots from the perimeter and, and, you know, also have a chance to – um, you know, on fast breaks and be able to, to get it to the rim. So, but, but I also wonder, you know, too, I think on the defensive side, we've seen this before in the SEC where, you know, there is an adjustment period sometimes for guys. Um, and look, I, he's at North Carolina. It's not like he's adjusting from a low major to, a, you know, a, a, an SEC level. But I think we, we've seen it, right? Like the speed of the game in the SEC, the, 
um, you know, the athleticism, the amount of free throws that are taken, the amount of fouls. Like, those are all things we've seen from Big Ben uh, in the SEC. And so there is always kind of an adjustment period, I think, when you come into the league. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe that's not just a case for Kessler. Maybe it's also one for Smith. I don't necessarily think so, but that is something that I would probably look at and say that is a bit of a wild card uh, in how you adjust uh, in that particular role. Well, we've talked about Auburn for 15 minutes, and we've not mentioned two guys who have a chance to be prominent players as transfers, which tells you a lot about the roster that we've gotten this far, and these names haven't come up. But you've got Zepp Jasper and Wendell Green, guys who average about 15.5 points each at their previous stops, which for Jasper was Charleston, and for Green was Eastern Kentucky. Green was a first-team all-OVC guy, and Jasper was, I think, a second-team guy in the Colonial. What are you expecting out of those guys? Because that's where Auburn is going to get a lot of usage in the backcourt from those two. Yeah, I mean, it's just another, I think, of any time we talk about transferring up. I mean, they, they've they had a pretty good record with that, I think, if you look at it you know, from a, from a standpoint of, of Auburn and having guys transfer in. But I think it's always hard to tell um, because, you know, too, it's not like for both of these guys, it's not like they're coming necessarily from programs that, you know, we're, we're so different than maybe what they're coming. I mean, remember Eastern Kentucky, right? Like if you look at Eastern Kentucky, they play, what is it? I, I've got to look this up because – under oh uh, they they are probably one of the fastest right, two or three yeah. teams in the country they might have led the country in tempo that is the way yeah. that they play that a. is a w hamilton a w yeah. hamilton style is we're going to be faster than anybody so that's one thing that like you know with green yeah. the conditioning is not going to be an issue well and that's where i think you know that's where we say when we how do you fit into auburn like that that feels like someone that really fits in auburn really well and um, I think, yeah, like it was, they finished second in tempo last year. And um, so that's that's certainly something that I think you look at and say, well, maybe not a huge adjustment period there. Meanwhile, on, on the flip side, uh, when you look at Zepp Jasper, uh, he played for Charleston, who uh, finished 345th in tempo. So a little bit different uh, on opposite ends of the spectrum there. But he is still someone that, that produced. And I think, you know, certainly uh, we'll have an opportunity to as someone that, Look, I mean, these guys have, I mean, look, you know, some of these guys have played for several years. And Charleston, is, I mean, we look at it, like that's been a pretty consistent program overall. Uh, maybe not so much last season, but, um, you know, Jasper's played several years. And I think that it, that experience is always going to help when you're trying to make that transition up to a place like the SEC. Um, so I, I think that is that is something where I, I expect them to, you know, have their opportunities to, to factor into the mix. And, and then I think it's where, you know, you have Katie Johnson from Georgia, and, and I think it's I, – I feel like he's probably, you know, the front runner in all of this to where he is someone who you don't necessarily have to have that concern with the transferring up part. Like, he in this league has already, you know, produced 14 points a game last season. Now, granted, for a bad team, but, uh, you know, it's like he already has that proven ability and, and as if, you know, Bruce Pearl is going to let anyone from Atlanta – uh, slip out of his hands uh, he gets a guy from Georgia now back to Auburn and it's just like I think he's also they've got options there and that's where we talk about the depth like I think having those three guys in particular we've already talked about the guys they've got coming back um, I mean they've they've got several different options to work with and I think that's that's always a good thing yeah, man, I did not mean to leave out Katie Johnson because that guy last year, I think, frankly, when he was on the floor for Georgia, he was probably their best player. Now, being on the floor was an issue. He didn't play to the middle, I think, of January, but he had some 20-plus point games. Um, he did that at times where he shot with decent efficiency, got to the foul line a lot, although I think he needs to get better there. But, yeah, that's another guy that I think fits in really well with what they want to do. Now, I think Xavier Wheeler was a guy on Georgia last year who got most of the attention. And again, he was a high volume guard, but I think I might've argued that KD Johnson was Georgia's best player last year when he was out there. Yeah. And I know this is an Auburn preview, but it's like, it's interesting to think what, what our conversation would be with Georgia if, you know, their two top players didn't transfer to other sec schools. So uh, with, with Wheeler, at Kentucky now and Johnson at Auburn. So yeah, those, I mean, I think he's going to be fine. Like, I feel like he's going to kind of form that punch with, with Flanagan to where that's a, that's a tough duo 
I think, to guard those guys. And, you know, I I think it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, what do the menace look like for, for Green and Jasper and um, guys like that? You know, Devin Cambridge, someone else on the wing that comes back. Um, you know, I, I think that they've, again, like it's, I think that's the most fascinating part to me is how – does the rotation shake out from a minute standpoint with this team? Uh, because th- they don't lack options, I think. And it's, okay, how how different are some of the roles or minutes from guys who really had to play a lot more last season versus some of these guys that are coming in? How, how many of those minutes do they take? But I think it goes back to what we talked about. That's where I think it's, okay, how does Walker Kessler fit into the mix? Um, you know, how, how does Green and Jasper, what do their minutes look like? Does that push out, you know, some of the minutes from some of the other guys that they have coming back? Uh, so th- that's what I think is going to be the most fascinating part is how Bruce Pearl kind of manages manages it all and and puts it all together to form that whatever, you know, eight, nine-man rotation and what exactly that looks like from a, a minute standpoint. Yeah, you stole my next thought. He's not going to have an issue coming up with eight or nine quality guys. It's going to be – who are they? And, and here's the thing that's going to be interesting too, Blake. In an era where guys transfer out, let's say someone falls behind that they're expecting to contribute this year and you're losing minutes before Christmas. You know, that mid-semester transfer thing uh, is, is a big deal. You see a lot of guys leaving at the break because they're not happy with their playing time. That's going to be something Bruce Pearl might have to manage too because you've got, you know, certainly – a lot of guys who are qualified to play and are, they're going to feel that way. How do you get your best rotation out there, but keep your guys around, especially some of the guys that you want to develop and have around two or three years from now? How do you do that and keep those guys happy too? I see that as their biggest challenge. Well, it's an interesting situation, isn't it? Because they've essentially already had one of those things this off season where, you know, Desi Seals transfers from Arkansas to Auburn. And then shortly after, you know, I think I want to say, and I don't want to say this specifically because I don't know exactly what the timeline was, but you know, that's where they did get Green coming in. They had Jasper come in, um, Katie Johnson comes in, and then you've got, you know, if you're Desi Seals, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, you know, that's that playing time. Maybe you think you're transferring from Arkansas to Auburn to get more playing time. Well, that all of a sudden is like there's no clear path to that anymore. And so, you know, he now transfers to Arkansas State, and so. Yeah, they, they've already kind of experienced that, and I think that is going to be very interesting to see uh, what that looks like. I think it's – well, I was going to say I think it's more so probably the backcourt, but I don't know. Like, I think Walker Kessler, like you said it best. Like, I think that, that wild card aspect of it, how many minutes he plays, you know, how many minutes does Jabari Smith play? Is he going to come out and just be someone that just comes in right away and plays 30-plus minutes? I don't know. Um, but I think that's that's going to be the interesting part. But as we've seen, too, with Bruce Burrell, you know, who says that he doesn't have, you know, four guards out there uh, doing their thing and you've got someone like Smith or Kessler or whoever, um, you know, in in the middle having a chance to, to really do everything else. And so he's he's not been shy about doing that before either. So he he will have, again, he will have plenty of opportunity, I think, to, to play any way he wants to play with this team. Uh, I think it's just that consistency and figuring out if some of these guys are actually going to be able to um, you know, live up to what we think they're going to be because, you know, that's what we said. I mean, you still – there are guys too, like, you know, Devin Cambridge and, um, you know, you talked about it with Jalen Williams. Like, he's someone who really got valuable experience last year. Uh, Dylan Cardwell, even as a big guy, you know, plays 15 minutes a game last year. Didn't average a ton of points, but he still played. And so, I mean, that just – like, they're they're 10-plus deep, I think, on this team. And, you know, I, I don't anticipate Bruce Pearl – you know, running five in and five out. But I also don't think he's afraid to play nine or ten guys on a consistent basis. And uh, I think that that will give them the luxury of of really being able to, I think, wear teams down because we, we've seen that before. Well, OK, a couple of things that you just brought up. It's not just like how do you keep all the guys happy with minutes, but these guys, a lot of them are just used to taking a high volume of shots, first of all. Um, you know, how do you – How do you manage that? The other thing with Kessler, to go back to him, this is why I think he's such a wild card. It's not just how does he get used? Is that perimeter? Is that underneath? But I'm thinking with all these guys hoisting up shots, you know, you you bring him out on the 
perimeter, that changes the dynamic of things. But you also need somebody underneath to grab the misses. And he's not a great rebounder for his size, but he is seven foot one, and that's a pretty good start. And so that just to me, it's not just what Kessler is as a player and how they use him, but how does that interplay with all the other guys on the roster? That just to me is something that I'm really fascinated to see how it pans out. And frankly, I, I think that in, in terms of wild cards as players, I mean, you name one in the league that's a bigger one than Walker Kessler, Blake. Good luck with that. <laughs> no, it's – um it, he he will be a big factor, I think, in, you know, whether this is a team we're talking about competing for an SEC title or if it's a team that I, – I would be surprised if Auburn's not an NCAA tournament team. I think that they're they're going to be in that category. I mean, I think they're – I don't know. I mean, I, they're they're good enough to, I think, compete for the SEC title. I don't know that I would put them ahead of a couple of these other teams yet, uh, like Alabama. I don't know that I would put them ahead of them right now or anything, but I do think they're good enough to compete for the title. And, and that's where, you know, Walker Kessler, I think how their rotation shakes out in the backcourt is interesting. Um, and then really, like I said, I think it's can they shoot the ball better than they have uh, probably over the past couple of seasons, because I think that's that's something too. But, you know, I say that last season was so different that I think it's really hard to take a lot away from what they had last. I mean, you know, that was that was an anomaly in terms of what they've been able to produce as a program over the past several seasons. Even that team that won 25 games uh, a couple of seasons ago, I mean, they, they shot 31% from three, and that was, you know, 301st nationally. So it's not like they don't necessarily have to have that. And I think sometimes maybe – I get too into, okay, it's a Bruce Pearl team. They're going to play fast. They're going to shoot threes. But they found other ways to win, too. Uh, so I think, though, in any way you look at it, it's just how does that rotation come together and, and how does Walker Kessler factor into that? And, you know, are Jasper and Green, are those guys, are they going to be able to – I don't you know I don't think anybody expects them to average 15 points a game or anything probably uh, this season. But can they be – What's the best? Like, can they be Samir Dowdy and Javon McCormick? You know, the two guys a couple of seasons ago who really just expanded into their roles and did what they needed to do. They weren't superstars. They didn't have to be superstars. Um, but can can those two guys be guys like that? Because, you know, they're going to have Katie Johnson. They're going to have Flanagan, like we said. Um, I think that, that that to me is probably – those are the things that are probably going to figure out, okay, is Auburn the SEC champion? Or maybe does Auburn kind of finish in that three to five range? Um, and we're talking about them as probably still a pretty significant, you know, seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, but I think that's that's that difference probably in that those two groups in particular. Well, to put it a different way, your question is really, do they have enough glue guys? That's always that's always important. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's just another way to say what you were saying. One more thing, uh, at least on my end, you may have some other thoughts before we finish up on Auburn today, but let's take coaching out of it, okay? If you just look at this roster, say, give them an average Power 5 type coach, is this a top 25 team on talent? Um, Probably not. But interesting. I don't but because they, they, you've got two McDonald's All-Americans in the right. front court. But I think, as we said, there are questions, I think, in terms of maybe effectiveness right off the bat. Well, it, it's shooting efficiency, isn't it? Is, is yeah. that not the concern? Yeah. Um, I, now, I say probably not. I I think they are. They would be close, but I am always going to give a Bruce Pearl coach team the benefit of the doubt over a lot of others, because I, I think that the track record in terms of what they produced and how he's turned the program around, I, I just, I don't know what the, you know, what, what does that number account for? I don't know, but I am always going to give them probably a significant boost because I've seen what he's been able to do to turn things around. And I've also seen that he has had no issue putting it all together, even when he's had, maybe a group that involves a lot of new guys. I just, I don't have a lot of doubt about that. And so, and that's not to say that I, they certainly have talent. Like that's one of the reasons why they're going to have a chance to compete for the title. But I just think that it's not that I'm saying that they're, they would be a bad team without him. I just think that he significantly pushes them forward 
a lot. And I, and you know, if you're asking me if there's an average coach with this team, could an average coach figure out the pieces to the puzzle to be able to get, keep everybody happy and, um, find the right rotation and, and all that. I, I don't know, but I, I, I do think Bruce Pearl will be able to do that. And so that's why I think I would give him a significant boost and feel a lot more confident saying that this is absolutely a top 25 team with him, with an average coach without him. I mean, it would it wouldn't be for lack of talent. It would be, could that average coach be able to figure out all the buttons to push? Because there's a lot of people to keep happy and there's a lot of talent, but can you, can you push all those right buttons to, to make sure that's, turns into a successful season. I can't say with complete certainty that I would be able to say that. Well, and that's what I was trying to get at, right? If you yeah. are willing to say that it might be a top 25 team just under ordinary circumstances, then chemistry is a big part of it, and they have some things to figure out. But Bruce has been pretty good about doing those things, and, and plus, you know, there's no question he's a top coach, probably top 10 in America. So I think if you feel like Auburn is a top 25 team, in terms of talent, I think there's an argument there, whether they are or not. Um, they're at least close. I mean, I, I think you'd say they're a top eight seed in the NCAA tournament based on talent, yeah. no matter who the coach is. Yeah. yeah. I, so, I, yeah. yeah, and Bruce Pearl's probably worth a couple of seed lines, safe to say. Yeah. So you're looking at a team that's probably, if we are picking, based on what people have done so far, you're looking at a team that if it goes according to expectations, that's a team that's got a, a five or a six next to its name on the seed lines when the field is drawn up in March. Yeah, I think they're a top three team in the SEC right now. I think that's kind of where I would slot them. Um, as I said, I which, you know, I guess that's probably two or three. Because I, I would, I, I, we talked about it. I think Alabama's the best team. Then I think is where you get into that conversation of, okay, is Kentucky going to be able to really completely revamp things? I think there's a chance they will. So I think you put Kentucky in that, that conversation. Tennessee, I'm always going to be hesitant about now. <laughs> Because I just we think about last season, Arkansas I think is pretty talented. Uh, Florida same way, but I I think I'm I would probably put Auburn ahead of most of those teams. I think it's just okay. Maybe what's that other team? Is it Kentucky? Is it Tennessee? Is it Arkansas? Um, I'm not sure, but I think I would I would put Auburn right there again with a chance to be knocking on the door to have a chance to to win an SEC title. Well, yeah, if Auburn is top three in the league, I, I think that you can go ahead and mark down a five or six seed because I, I think you've got a half dozen teams there. Arkansas, Auburn, Kentucky, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, LSU might be in that discussion too. So I, I think if that's where Auburn ends up, it's been a pretty good regular season and it will put itself in great shape for the NCAA tournament. Blake, any parting thoughts on Auburn today before we end this episode? No, like I said, would be very surprised if it's not a, a big bit bounce back season for them after going 13 and 14 last year. I think they'll be, they'll be back into that 20 plus win range this season. They should be. And uh, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of talent as you, as you alluded to. And um, yeah, I just, I think they'll, they'll be back on track uh, this season. Well, thank you for listening to our SEC basketball roster preview series for the 2021-22 season. He's Blake Lovell. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube at the 14. Be sure and follow us on Twitter at 14southeastern.com, or excuse me, at 14southeastern. Be sure to visit our website at southeastern14.com. We've been in off-season mode, but we've got football stuff coming, more basketball. Anyway, for Blake, I'm Chris Lee, your host. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with another episode in our preview series of SEC basketball rosters very soon.